Hello, fellow followers. Welcome back to Fan Scene. And with me today is David Weiner, the director of In Search of Darkness 1, 2, and 3. How are you doing, David? I'm doing well. I'm very excited to talk all about the capper to the trilogy of In Search of Darkness. I'm really looking forward to this because I've really, really enjoyed the In Search of Darkness movies and In Search of Tomorrow. Uh, those were really great documentaries. And I love the fact that these are like four hour documentaries and it covers the whole decade. I mean, to me, I can never not have enough of that. Well, if you put this movie together, so, in, you know, um, in search of darkness, part one was about uh, a, just under four and a half hours. Search of darkness. Part two was four and a half hours and a little change. We're now uh, we are with the final installment of this trilogy of 80s horror coverage it's now over five hours long so it's the longest in search of darkness ever and you put that together as a trilogy you've got like over 14 hours of 80s horror goodness so i mean goodness, goodness me that's a lot <laughs> that's a lot and you know what i can never really get tired of it i just love hearing i love hearing the stories you guys get from all these actors directors and behind the scenes like the physical uh i about said physical media <laughs> practical effects is what i meant uh, all the practical effects people and everything and it's just so interesting so uh and, and physical media because yes, you know, physical media not to not to like dive ahead of you but i mean this whole decade would have not been as explosive as it was if it weren't for the video revolution and that's of course all about physical media right exactly i mean the vhs box art cover art that's just like the releases that we've we had the mom and pop video stores the you know i know a lot of people don't like it and i get it in blockbuster but you could find some stuff decent there at times but the mom and pops was where it was at and just to find all these and so i, I know this this third one is a little different than the first two it was a little mm -hmm. more fan geared uh, and directed so how did that all come about well for those for those uninitiated and i'm just talking to the two of you in the back there everyone else seems to know <laughs> what we're talking about uh you know in search of darkness uh is a long-form documentary crowdfunded uh, about 80s horror. And the first one uh, ended up being, like I said, four and a half hours and yeah. structured from year by year, 1980 to 1989. And each year we cover a number of films and film segments. And then in between we have larger context chapters in between talking about some of the bigger concepts uh, of the decade and how it affected and impacted film and those films that were made and i love um, those little segments too yeah uh yeah. And you really you really need those they're like palate yeah. cleansers but it really broadens not only does it broaden the, the the context and the perspective of the decade um i think you need them as little you know little little breaks in between mm -hmm. the whole stretch of films uh, yeah. and then what we do is we bring in you know legends and icons and experts from the era and who are passionate about the era uh, to talk all about this stuff, and it's a big celebration of the era. And so, for the first one, we really covered a lot of heavy hitters, a lot of the fran big, you know, franchises yeah. and sequels and that kind of stuff. But there are plenty of eclectic titles in there too, if you are paying attention. Um, but we stayed uh, very much in North America, and then for part two, we went international, and yeah. we did a lot of European, a lot of Italian horror, uh, and a lot of the uh, more eclectic titles that. If you're a real horror fan, then I think you're like, wow, there's there's something more here. You know, I always knew about this thing. You know, I'm so thankful that they're covering that. But there's still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of titles that came out in the era. And yeah. so there's no way you can cover it in two movies where you're doing uh, two documentaries where you're covering like, you know, 150 movies. That's like scratching the surface. So yeah, there's so many. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Through, good. You know? <laughs> so we have, this time around, we have uh, uh, just about 80 new movie segments, which is wow. more than ever before. Didn't want to hold back. Uh, you know, it's if the one that you're hoping for didn't make it, my apologies, but there's always going to be ones that slip through the cracks. But these are really kind of the, you know, the dusty back shelf of oh, yes. horror that you're like, if you're a real hardcore horror fan, you're like, this is not dusty on my shelf because I go to these all the time. Yeah. But uh, among those, there's lots of theatrical titles that we just haven't gotten to yet. You know, um, you know, if it came out in the theater uh, and we still haven't covered it, like you'd, you'd be surprised because we've referenced it, but we still haven't done prom night yet. 
And oh, then again, yeah. we also didn't do like The Hand, you know, starring Michael Caine, you know, uh, Oliver Stone's first movie. Yeah. There's a lot of really great, fun, cool stuff that was theatrical. Monkey Shines, George Romero's Monkey Shines. Like, how could, you, movie. How could you not have that? And we just haven't gotten to it yet. And um, you try and prioritize these things and you realize that there's just so much ground to cover that, uh, you know, We'll, we'll yeah. see what happens in the future, but we, we did as much as we could to continue down a dark path, continue going into more eclectic stuff, whether it's Canadian horror, uh, Asian horror, Mexican, you know, Spanish yeah. horror, um, all that stuff. We, we did our best to get a lot of the uh, uh, artists who were part of the, that movement in the 80s. And I think collectively, you look at this as a trilogy, it's, it's massive. And as a film, if you've seen the first two and you love them or, are, or like them enough to watch another and demand another, um, you said fans. And I'll say yeah. what's important about this is that all this content is 100% chosen by the fans. 100%. Exactly. Yeah. That's and what I was really excited about. Talk about at least, I, I would love to hear your perspective about how you got, how you as fans and backers and enthusiasts of the genre got to pretty much drive the content of this movie it was it was fun i mean i because you know after seeing the first two movies uh, the first two documentaries like you said with the first one it was the heavy hitters it was you know a lot of stuff i knew maybe there was like four or five titles in that one i didn't quite know and then the second one you did you went a little further and i was like i didn't know some of these at all and it really got me into wanting to see more and one of my favorite lines is that by Tom Savini about if you haven't seen, I can never quite remember how I said this, but if you've never seen it, just because it's old and you've never seen it, it's still new to you. Right. So I really, yes, I really love that. And and to see that you guys that are so fan interactive and then, you know, you, like you said, you can't just cover everything and you went a little darker. And so it was fun to be able to see as you back the third one that you get to choose a list of movies of stuff that maybe you want to see covered and that maybe you didn't know about and to hear what other people think and what they want to see and what they grew up watching. I'm really interested in seeing that. And I really like that you guys have that participation for us and as the backers and what we can achieve with you guys. I just, I just love that. The, the fact, the fact that we're doing a third in search of darkness uh, is entirely due to the passion and enthusiasm of everyone who watched the first two and said, I could watch these 24 seven and want more. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it would be uh, some sort of crime if we put together a whole third movie without the input of everyone saying, this is what we want to see. You know, uh, I've yeah. been taking copious notes ever since part one about, well, this wasn't in there. You know, this is a terrible documentary. How could you avoid <laughs> X, Y, and Z, you know? I, I mean, I've been trying to put extra in this movie for three movies now, and I finally succeeded. So finally. Uh, and we even got the director. Uh, oh, that's cool. Uh, for extra. And so sometimes, you know, good things come to those who wait. But, um, yeah. you know, there are so many amazing eclectic titles and there are other titles that I kind of glossed over thinking, well, I mentioned it, maybe that's enough. And then you put us, I, we, we did a survey with uh, the backers where not only did you just do all your write-ins, but then you guys all got to vote based on yeah. the top write-ins. And, you know, I, I was, I was a little bit amazed that like Critters was, was one of the top demanded films. Um, you can't so see it, but it's up there. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, and nothing, nothing bad about critters. It's just to me, it's a little more mainstream in comparison to some of the hardcore stuff that everybody loves. But yeah. we were proud to put that in, and I was able to talk to D. Wallace all about critters as well. And you know, and I think this is real fun, a real fun celebration. It keeps the party going. It's rough around the edges, uh, but it's longer. And um, I'm real proud of the, the team at Creator VC from executive producer Robin Block all the way down. You know, we've got everyone who's been working on this continues to work on part three now. So we have Weary Pines doing the music. Awesome. Uh, Samuel Way, who's edited part one and part two, is back on board doing his magic. Paul Conshake, who, uh, you know, who did all of our graphics for part one and part two, he's He's busy right now as we speak, you know, working those ones and zeros. Yeah. 
the finish of this film. Um, and uh, it, the film is done, but we're in the hardcore polish stage. Yeah. You know, uh, it's like uh, you could bake your chicken, but if it's not seasoned, it's not it's not finally it's not done. done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what we're kind of where we kind of are right now as uh, we're running this campaign from uh, October 6th to October 31st. It's the final sale for In Search of Darkness Part 3. Um, we could talk about it at the end as well, but 80shorrordoc.com, you find out all the details about all the cool stuff that you get. You get your name in the credits. You get to be part of this too. I'll just mention it now. Um, and I'll, I'll put a link in the bottom for everybody sure. to click to. Plus, it helps my channel. So, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the cool, but the cool thing is, uh, you get your name in the credits, and you can say you help make this come alive. Uh, but on top of that, we're doing something that we had never done before, and that's we're inviting everyone to record their own video about how passionate you are about horror, about. Uh, any horror filmmakers, about 80s horror, even about the In Search of Darkness uh, franchise, what it means to you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these videos and no, it's not guaranteed that everything is going to make it, but I'm going to put as many, you know how long those end credits can be. Yeah. I'm going to pack the end credits with everybody's testimonial about uh, why they love this stuff and why these movies are made essentially for all of us these documentaries and these films. I did, I did not know you guys were doing that. So oh, I may yeah. have to, I may have to record one myself for you guys. You and must, you, guys. you must. Yes, yes. Cause I, I dig them. I love them. And you know, I grew up, I, as I've said multiple times here on my channel, I grew up like with Monster Vision and watching really late night cable, watching some movies that I probably should not have been watching all around <laughs> as, as a kid. And to, with your guys' documentaries, I've gone back and I was like, I can't believe I missed that. I can't believe I missed this or I wasn't allowed to see this. And, and it's fun to find all those. And it's fun to see everything that you guys put into this and uh, all the work. And uh, I got, I'm curious here. Is there oh, well, any let me movies? say real quick, and I, and I apologize to interrupt, so no, please no, go hold, ahead. That, hold that train of thought. Because um, people are going to be like, oh, I want to record something. Where do I go? And, oh, and yes, yes, yes. Um, everything is at 80shorrordoc.com, but I think the way you could find the way to record all the specifics and where to send it uh, is in the link tree. If you go to, like, you know, the, our socials, like Twitter, you know how there's, like, a link tree of yeah, links. The, yeah, with all there. the... Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever that we have a link tree, there should be a link or there will be a link in there showing you where to go uh, to submit your video. Please continue. Sorry. Yes, yes, that's fine. That's actually, I was going to ask you about that here, <laughs> you know, how to do that. But um, I'm curious, though, is, is there anything in these this third documentary that maybe you want it? Because I know you mentioned like Critters and how it's, I, that just does surprise me because I've seen where you guys were going, like with the second one, how you went a little darker and the third one, you're getting darker and bigger and better and bolder. So I was curious, is there anything that you wanted to see as the director that mm -hmm. you haven't got to put in the first two that maybe the fans picked or that you put in yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it, and I'll give you a, a very specific answer, but it's kind of twofold because a lot of the stuff that I want, the fans wanted as well. I mean, there's literally nothing on the list of the 80 films in this movie that was not mentioned in a survey or on social media or in a complaint. Why didn't you do this? <laughs> you know, a, a, well, a good natured complaint. But yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, it's yeah. like, uh, uh, but I go back. I mean, there, I love these movies so much. Um, but there are some of these movies where, uh, I was too young when they came out and like you, you know, it's kind of forbidden yeah. fruit, you know, so I would, I would, I would really respond to the, the marketing campaign. So if there was a poster or there was like a killer trailer uh, commercial on TV, you know, like I was growing up in the wake of Jaws, Blood Beach comes out, yes. you know, just when you thought you, you was safe to go back to the water, you can't get to it. You know, I was just like, <laughs> Yeah. Holy shit, I got to watch <laughs> Blood Beach. This is insane. Bikinis and blood. I you know, This is like the movie. And that's the movie that got away from me. I, like, I, never, I never saw Blood Beach until much later. Uh, yeah. and, and I realized and learned through the making of this film that Blood Beach is next to impossible to get. You can get oh. it on VHS. You know, you might be able to find it on, on YouTube if someone put it up there. But it, it, it's not cross the digital divide. So it never went to Blu-ray. It's not on streaming. It's impossible to find. 
So that's that crazy. to me made it that much more of a of a title that I wanted to tackle and include because that's a movie, listen, they're not all gems, but they're important to us. That's what's important mm -hmm. about all these films. And Blood Beach is one of those movies where I don't want it to just sort of disappear into the ether and no one's ever heard of it uh, and had a chance to appreciate what it does have to offer. So there you go. I, I'll give you I, that. That's and awesome. I'll give, you, I'll give you one more title, too. Okay, go ahead. I'm just all excited and caffeinated. I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited, too, because I'm like you're, loving hearing this. You're, you're getting your... You've loosened me up with the alcohol, and now I'm just going to spill all this. Stuff. <laughs> just give him a good stiff drink, and it, it just all flows. <laughs> I'm easy. Um, uh, Fear No Evil is another one, um, oh. uh, and that's from the same era. So they're both actually – they both came out in early 1981, so Fear No Evil and uh, uh, Blood Beach. But Fear No Evil is one that is sort of – caught the wave of this supernatural – horror the supernatural teen horror so like in the wake of like carrie for example yeah everyone wanted to have like you know a high school supernatural revenge fantasy and fear no evil was that and i remember seeing uh newspaper advertisements i remember seeing uh ads in the in uh you know late night uh trailers on yeah. tv you know during a creature feature the the fear no evil trailer would get pop on and i'd be like oh this looks so scary i got to see it you know yeah i was too young and um i i thought to myself when i looked at a lot of these titles i know them inside and out but some of them i still had never seen and i thought to myself well why have i never seen this and i kind of realized that they were always available when I'd walk by the shelf on the video store saying, I'll get that one day. I'll get yeah. that one day. That's on my list, but this one's more important. That one's more important right now based on my mood. Exactly. I'll get the fear no evil. It's always going to be there. And it wasn't always going to be there because the video stores went away. You know, Which I, I just, I really do miss those places. And, I truly do. Oh, and that's the thing. It, it kind of dawned on me. It's a very simple answer, but all the stuff that was literally at my fingertips was no longer at my fingertips. So then when I'm on streaming or, you know, whatever, however else you find films these days, you know, digitally, yeah. it's not visually in front of me saying you, you wanted to rent me. Remember you love me. Yeah. You wanted to check me out, you know? And I was like, so I, I would go through whenever I make these films as I put together this massive list that never can all be done. And yeah. I just say, who can we get? Who's worked on these? Who directed these? Who starred in these? Who knows about these? You know, what do I think is a great film or, or a notable film? What means something to me that I can finally tackle? Uh, and Fear No Evil was one of those. And uh, so I went out of my way to, uh, to get Frank LaLoja, who directed that and the Lady in White, which I saw in the theater when I was a kid. That movie scared uh, me. He was talking about these films, and so I'm real happy that we have him. We, he was in Italy. We had to chase him down, you know, in between pasta meals to sit down. With us. <laughs> That's cool because uh, Lady in White. That is one that really, really scared me as a kid. I remember seeing that, and I uh, just like the the woman and the, the way she just flows, and and the kid just. I, I, that movie yeah, Luke, was scary. Lucas Haas. Lucas yeah, Lucas Haas. From, yeah. uh, from Witness. He was introduced yeah. in Witness with Kelly McGillis and Harrison Ford, the Amish thriller. Great yeah. movie. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden, everyone said, I want Lucas Haas, the cute kid with the big ears, you know, in my yeah. movie. And yeah. And he's in Lady in White. And that, that movie is this, it's, it's almost like a gateway horror film. Um, and it's it is it captures New England and Halloween and it's it's a uh, it's a beautifully done film. Yeah, it does. and it always gave off to me like the vibe of like uh, the scarier version of uh, oh my gosh, I can't think of the movie now. It just slipped my never ending story. It always oh, gave me off know. like that, yeah. like the scare because he gets locked in the building and you know he's bullied. So like that was always like th that's what always scared me because like you know kids. You, you could be cruel back in the day, you know, and it was it was rough. That was, a, but that's such a good movie. To that point, I I come back to it over and over and over again. Like you could put as many monsters and supernatural creatures uh, on screen, and they're scary and fun and whatever. The scariest, the scariest things in the world are, people. you know, malevolent people. Yeah. You know, whether it's whether it's an adult or a kid, you know, people can be real cruel to other people. Yeah. And, you know, that that resonates with me. 
that yeah. sadly that's always you know it doesn't matter how outrageous your boogeyman become it comes down to humanity is the most frightening thing yeah i think that's yeah, you get, like in a, a post-apocalyptic film you know you get to the point where like the zombies aren't scary it's the people who want to take your shit and, yeah. and, and kill you or so you know subject you to you know human misery and slavery yeah that you really need to be scared of you know yeah and, true i, I agree, agree. And I think that's what makes some of those like older like '80s movies and stuff like that, like with the Lady in White and all that, so much more scarier because they do have that element of like the people, you know, or this like driving force of what brings about misery to these people or causes these monsters to come back from the grave and everything. So yeah, I, I totally get that. It is it is scary? But I'm I'm really glad to hear it. And I I've actually not seen Fear No Evil. Was it that's what it's called? Fear No Evil. Fear No I've Evil. I've not yep. seen that, so I will have to try to look into that one myself. Well, I will say one thing about the film. Um, I always wanted to see it, and then when I saw it, it was nothing like I expected it. It's all I, I'm gonna say. Nothing that's like in, I expected yeah. it to be. I've, I've found that myself as well, too. Like when you sometimes you've seen something on the shelf and you've passed it by and you want to see it. And then when you eventually get to see it, it's not at all what you imagined in your head. Sometimes it's a lot better. Sometimes it's not. But it's still yeah, a fun you, watch. You, you build these things up in your head sometimes. But for me, yeah. it was just uh, narratively. I don't want to reveal anything just yes. for those who haven't seen it. But um, what you're expecting and then narratively the the choices that Frank Lelogia makes to tell that story, it's, uh, you know, different. It's yeah. different. Yeah. And I do love that you guys covered that in the first one about uh, the video stores and people collecting and how movies are being lost. Like you mentioned, uh, Shark Beach there. Um, you know, you can't find that on digital. You can't find that on a Blu-ray. You, called, or DVD. you called it Shark Beach. I did call it Shark Beach, didn't I? <laughs> you're, thinking, well, you're thinking Jaws. And yes, Blue I was Beach. thinking Jaws and everything. Yeah, yeah. But yes, I, that's, I like that you covered it because it is true. And oftentimes I'm asked, why do you buy certain VHSs when there's Blu-rays, 4Ks, DVDs? I'm like, well, sometimes you never know if you this movie will ever be transferred over to a digital format or blu-ray 4k and which was really cool that i did see that they found uh, that leanna quigley movie which is coming out um darkness in the heartland it's oh. a satanic panic type movie from the 80s and I, it's been I, this is news to me Tell oh me yes I, I just saw this it's uh um it's one of her lost films it was never released on vhs dvd blu-ray anything ever before visual vengeance just found it and they are releasing it in a nice blu-ray set uh it's from the direct you know they, you got the director and they went they rescanned the from the because it was shot on video so mm -hmm. it will not be presented in like hd it's still a sd but it will be on a blu-ray disc so yeah, so if you're into like those like 80s satanic shot on film, satanic <laughs> panic shot on film videos and Leanna Quigley, which I love Leanna Quigley. Yeah. Um, this might be something that collectors want to get because it, they usually don't make a lot of these Blu-rays. Well, Leanna Le Le yeah. Quigley had plenty to talk about. And, uh, and, and so she's in In Search of Darkness Part 3, telling more tales. Uh, um, and uh, we live in a glorious age because they currently... Full Moon is finishing up uh, uh, um, Sorority Babes in the Slimeball yes. Bolorama Part 2. And so we have her talking about Part 1 uh, in the film, which is very cool. And, um, you know, it's funny that you talk about the shot on video and these things are lost. So many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Like when, when I say that hundreds of movies came out, it's more like, you know, over into the, the, the th it crosses the digits into the thousands. Yeah. Because uh, so many things were shot on video, but they never, no one cared beyond. They got distribution on, on a couple mom and pop store shelves. They got, they paid for it and they went away. You know, this yeah. was a, this was an era when, when filmmakers saw an opportunity to bypass the gatekeepers of Hollywood and say, just get a video camera, shoot it on video, release it for real inexpensive find a distributor who's just going to make great artwork and it'll sell and it doesn't matter people will yeah. lap it up because it's got a great exploitation cover it doesn't matter what the quality of the film is and so we cover uh we cover that concept as well is that uh you know in this video revolution was a whole other breed of film like boarding house for example you know uh where people were just like i could shoot this on film um, I'm sorry, I could shoot this on video, video yeah. and save a tremendous amount of money and it'll sell really, really well. Uh, and, and, and that caught on so much so where there's some people who they, they would transfer from video to, uh, uh, to, to celluloid 
oh, know, yeah, to yeah. film so they can get a couple theatrical releases, but everything else they made all their money on video. Okay, yep. And sometimes they would turn it right back into, you know, from film back to video because it was cheaper. It's a very strange process, but there are some people who did what they, they spent more money than they intended to when they didn't understand yeah. how it worked. Yeah. Which is uh, which is crazy. I mean, it's it, that's interesting to see how like the shape of that have turned out through, with like independent filmmakers today and everything like you guys are even doing. How that has sort of progressed into something similar to like this. Uh, so what's that's pretty cool. And it, uh, I just hope some of these actually do get found and rescued because it's it is. I always say like. Um, it's like a part of history. It may not be like history, history, but it's a part of history, pop culture, entertainment and stuff that so many people love and grew up with and remember. And it's something that I think really needs to be preserved and not be lost. Film, film preservation is, is incredibly important to film geeks and film yes. historians. And as we speak, it's like a ticking clock. Uh, you know, there's, there's films in all sorts of places that, uh, if, especially if they were shot on, whether it was shot on video or film, uh, it, the degradation of, with age yeah, uh, over makes time. these things un, un, unsavable. Um, and so it doesn't matter what the quality of the film is, it's a part of film history and exactly. it has its place. Uh, and, and arguably you could say a lot of these films that aren't important films in terms of their content are important as a, as a reflection of the times. Whatever, exactly. Whatever you want to say about that. And so uh, it costs money, and money is yeah. the, the prohibiting factor to a lot of these films that are going to turn into dust yeah. uh, soon. So, you know, film preservation, if you see people who are, who are legit doing proper film preservation, especially if it's genre film, support them or spread the word. Yeah, you know, yeah, because otherwise it's going to go up. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Bill Lustig. He, he actually said that, like, with a lot of these boutique Blu ray labels that are licensing these films and stuff and making them. In about five years, he said a lot of them is going to be out of business because there's not going to be that many films to license. So we're living in an age sort of right now, as uh, people, you know, physical media, film lovers, and all that, uh, that you should support these films while you can because they won't. They won't be there in like five years. You may not be mm -hmm. getting Heartland in the Darkness, this and a Quigley Lost film ever again. So, you know, it's, it's a good time to be a collector, but it's also sad to think about what lies ahead if they're not preserved. So I try not to think about it. It keeps me. Yeah, I don't, want, I don't want to think about it as well, too. Uh, <laughs> but I am like really, really interested to see how this documentary turns out, how it plays out. And uh, I, I'm glad I backed it. I'm glad I can continue to help you guys. Uh, you know, I, I love supporting uh, your guys' work, Creator VC, it's you, Robin Block. Yes. I, I, and I, I very much appreciate you doing this interview with me and allowing me to be a, a small part of this in some way, shape or form. Uh, cause it's just, it really has, I've said this a million times. I said it in my, uh, in search of tomorrow, uh, review, it does bring me back to my childhood. And I, I know nostalgia can play. Some people don't like nostalgia. Some people look at it as bad, but nostalgia to me, if done right, is something beautiful and something that you go, you know what? That was a good time. I love I, that. I, I, have a, I, have I, have that. A, I have a legit question. Just the perception of nostalgia. You know, uh -huh. we, we've talked about why nostalgia is good just now. You know, I mean, it yeah. takes us back not only to uh, a time and a place, but, you know, a whole era of, of, of content creation. Um, I, I say over and over because it's, it's very true to me that when you look back at a lot of these films, uh, they don't have to be winners. No. They, mean, they mean something to us. Uh, you know, who we were watching with, you know, should we have been watching them at all? Exactly. You know, what was going on in our life? What song did we listen to on the way there to the theater or, you know, hanging out in the basement of a friend with a, with a bootleg copy of something that we not, should not have been watching. Yeah. And, it, and, and we were up at night and we couldn't sleep, but we couldn't tell our parents because. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. But like, I, I asked, I asked this, um, you know, rhetorically and feel free to answer if you want if, if you mm -hmm. have it so it's like what is wrong with nostalgia i personally i don't think 
anything is wrong with nostalgia at all. Well, especially, what do, think, what do you think people think? I think some people think it's bad because it plays on their emotions. And some people, uh, you know, I guess they don't want to look back in the past or whatever. And so they kind of want to move forward and see newer stuff and newer creative ideals and everything. But there's a lot of new stuff and creative ideals that can come out of nostalgia. You can be inspired by nostalgia. You can look back and like you said, like I remember what speaking of full moon features, I remember it being in my room with my brother and watching the Puppet Master movies, at least the first six of them. Like we have one of those little, you know, TV sets with the VCR built in, like nine inch TV, we're renting <laughs> yeah. them and popping in the Puppet Master movies and just like having a blast and watching the J Freddy and Jason and staying up all night. And it just like, sometimes you think about that and it's fun and it can create these memories. And honestly, it's what's inspired me along with so many other people to put myself on a YouTube channel and talk about these films or try to create something new or try to create a new video. And it's inspired me to want to be able, cause I, I'm not a filmmaker or anything like that, but I've seen people get on YouTube and end up be making movies. And I'm like, I think maybe if I can grow and change and learn and think back about my nostalgia, I can maybe make a movie myself down the line, you know, cause I've, I, I think that would be cool. And I think nostalgia plays a big part in that. And it plays a big part of what a lot of people do today. And uh, even the people that seem to hate nostalgia, they think, oh, it's bad. It, you no, know, we need something new. Well, you're still thinking your nostalgia, it's for that new stuff. You know, you're not, you, I don't think they realize that it's still inspiring them regardless whether they hate it or not. Nostalgia can be a, a powerful motivator. Um, I, 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 there's room for both. You know, there's room for new and there's room for fondly looking back at the things that we love. There's room for both. Yes. Um, I, I think I think cynicism uh, is, is sometimes uh, used in place of, of intellect uh, and they're, they're not one and the same. You know, uh, if you're yeah. condescending, if one is condescending about, you know, whether it's a genre or an approach to a genre, um, that's fine. You know, yeah. uh, but you gotta, I think you gotta put your money where your mouth is and you really gotta champion brand new ideas and brand new content. Yeah. And uh, a lot of a lot of the time, a lot of times people who are saying, I need something new, not a remake. And I, I often agree, do we really have to remake yet another thing? You know, exactly. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reboots and remakes that I'm like, don't need that. But yeah, I'm don't need it at all. Not. But, uh, you know, um, at the end of the day, nostalgia is powerful. There's room for both new and nostalgic, and uh, and I think you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't go around telling people what what you think is bad is bad for them as well. That's all yeah. I can say about it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, and yeah, I I'm kind of get fed up with the remakes and the reboots, and the, I'm not even get I'm getting to the point where I don't even like legacy sequels because I think. Because a lot of times the legacy sequels, it's cool to go back to that world and continue where the, you know, maybe in the 80s or in that now. But I sometimes I don't think some of the people working on those realize what made this one so popular. So, uh, you know, why we loved it. And it kind of gets lost in translation. Yeah, money. Definitely money. And it definitely gets lost in translation. Hollywood is, is fueled first and foremost by the almighty dollar, including mm -hmm. 80s horror and the reason yep. why all those movies were made. Uh, if you think all those movies were made for art first, um, <laughs> you're, you're sorely mistaken. Maybe a filmmaker had the art first, but the producer was thinking the dollar first. Yes. Uh, and at the end of the day, we got a lot of great things uh, because I think people were less concerned about uh, uh, longevity and they wanted yeah. a, an immediate turnaround. And so I think the more bonkers and the more crazy they figured that's, that's what works. Uh, yeah. and, uh, these days, uh, I think things are much more calculated. Yes. Um, um, and that's, I don't think a cynical approach to it. I think, you know, you always have to remember money is what drives everything. And that's mm -hmm. why you get all these reboots and reimaginings and, you know, uh, yes. legacy sequels and like, stuff like yeah. that because it's, it's established, uh, uh, you Franchised. know. Franchised. Yeah, you know, intellectual <laughs> IP. It's established yeah, IP. IP. A franchise and IP that uh, that you can merchandise. And Halloween, you could sell more stuff. And yeah. Listen, the more the merrier if that's what you want. That's great. Like, I mean, yeah. I, I was walking through Spirit Halloween with my kid, and I could not believe the – how 80s horror is front and center with, with you know, Chucky and Pinhead yeah. and, you know, Fr uh, Freddie and Jason <laughs> and other clowns and, 
you know, um, I think it's great. You know, I mean, it's me like I really I had to guard my my wallet very tight. I had to leave my wallet. Tell me about it. I but, um, I was at Spirit Halloween and I the most I got this. I don't know if you can see it glare. It's yeah. a Universal Monsters Cup. Nice. <laughs> so I, it's, I was like, yeah, I was there. I was like, yeah. I was like, uh, that's how much is that? I'll just get that because <laughs> listen, so listen. much. I am not a nostalgic oh, awesome. person at all. I swear. <laughs> that's cool yeah because I, I i think that's a testament bringing it back to 80s horror is like with that spirit halloween is that people still are fond of 80s horror that's still what they prefer to watch uh like we said the reboots remakes legacy sequels new horror that's fine if you like them and you know they people do like them but if you look at the spirit Halloween and stuff, it's eighties, it's eighties mm. horror. You look at what people start watching around Halloween, even though I watch horror movies all year long, you start looking at what people watch around October and September it's eighties horror. It's typically that. And then they move on into the nineties, a few here and there. And so, you know, that's, it's just the power and it, I just love it. I just love it. And I, I'm looking forward to in search of darkness three very, very much. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in Search of Darkness 3 is is the result of uh, many years of buildup, essentially. You know, this, this movie would not exist if uh, after part one, people didn't demand a part two. And yeah. after part two came out, people said, I want part three. I, I and Robin were like, really? You know, this is what you would want and hope for. But we were a bit shocked. We're like, you know, really? Really? Yeah. You could watch this 24-7? <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, it's the, just the ultimate compliment. And so it just is very cool that we could go uh, go back to the 80s well one more time. And it's not the bottom of the barrel. It really, there's yeah. so much rich content that it's still not enough. And we're still not able to cover it all. Um, but, you know, In Search of Darkness Part 3, you go to 80s, you know, you said it's all at the bottom. Yeah, it will be all in the description for everybody. But uh, 80shorrordoc.com, 80s, 80shorrordoc.com. Uh, we're running this final sale until midnight Halloween. You can get your name in the credits, which is super cool. How often do people offer that? So yes. it's like a piece of horror history that you could hand down to your children and say, I, my name is in this, and yes. I made this all happen. And, and it's personalized, you know? Yes. It's personalized. And Anyway, you know, as we do these in the past, we're a small company, you know, um, so we do we create a limited run based on once we get everyone that we have their uh, their, um, you know, get their credit. We put it all together and then it comes yeah. out and everyone gets a nice physical copy in their hands. But if you've missed the first two In Search of Darknesses, we're also going to make those available. So if you only got one or part two, you can now get one or both or buy the trilogy and get a box set, get a cool slipcase for that. Yeah. Uh, lots of bells and whistles and cool stuff, digital downloads, the, the soundtrack, get the trilogy or just get the film uh, by itself with all these cool things in it. Um, there's a membership card where uh, it's like a little, little video membership card and on there uh, a bunch of merchants are joining us where you can get discounts on some of their cool stuff. That's awesome. You know, we just thought, what would we want? You know, in addition to the film, it's like as a companion to the film, what cool things can we do? Yeah. So go to 80shorrordoc.com. You can see all the stuff. And then, uh, you know, it runs till midnight and tell your friends. Yeah, tell, tell, tell your friends, share this video, I'll let everybody see it. And like I said, when you, I'll have the link in the below. And when you click on that link, that helps me, that helps my channel, and it helps you guys. And I'm so happy for that. And I'm looking forward to it. And I, I bought, yeah, down hit the link. I bought the, the first one when I backed the third one because I don't have the first one on Blu ray, I have it on digital. So, oh, now, okay. Yeah, well, like, so. I'm glad that we're like, it, we, we wanted to make sure. That yeah. if there's a missing piece and people are completists like me, you know, because I got when I got the second one and I was like, I don't have the first one on Blu-ray because I missed the first one. And so I was like, when you guys started offering it, I was like, I'm getting the first one on Blu-ray and then I'm getting the third one. Now I have all three of them and I'm happy. I'm so <laughs> happy and I'm looking forward to it because I, I love it. I, if you have physical media all the way and I love having that and I'm just super excited and uh, I know you have to get go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say one last thing about physical media and talking about this digital divide, you know, um, I, I found out the hard way 
when Netflix first came out, because Netflix was kind of like the online video store. Remember? Yeah. In the olden days, when Netflix first came out, compared to Blockbuster, you could have the video, sorry, the, the discs, your yeah. DVD yeah. and your Blu-ray mailed to you. And I thought, how cool and convenient is that? And then when they went, you know, were digital, uh, you know, streaming, I was just like, well, there's an online video store, Netflix. I don't need all these extraneous DVDs. Yeah. I didn't sell them all, luckily, but I sold <laughs> a couple. And then I started realizing, oh, wait a minute, these things rotate. They come and go and sometimes yes. come back on all of these streaming sites, wherever you are. Due to mm -hmm. licensing, things have a limited run, limited window, a couple months or a couple of years, but they're gone. Yep. They may not come back. So there's really something to be said about physical media, especially for an indie company like us. Not only mm -hmm. does it help support the production of this film, but you're not going to be able to find this other than really expensive on eBay if you yeah. have this opportunity. Yeah, yep. And I'm glad that you guys put it out on a Blu-ray. And I'm glad. Yes, and that's, that's something I've talked about here is like uh, the stream. I'm if you, if you're cool with streaming and all that, I'm good. That's fine. I'm just somebody who prefers a physical thing, and I do have streaming myself. Uh, but yes, with like the licensing issues and everything, and Netflix, especially Netflix and Disney Plus, I think are like the two worst offenders of all the streaming systems. So uh, get onto this. Get your Blu-ray copy of. In search of darkness one two and three with this big sale coming up and uh i know you got to get going so before you go is there anything you can tell us about what's ahead for creator vc what other uh, things do you guys have in the pipeline we have we have lots of things in the pipeline currently uh we we just uh are finished up um aliens expanded uh the initial crowdfunding campaign uh but if you go check out aliens expanded that's James Cameron's Aliens. We're taking yes. a, a laser focused look uh, and a deep dive into everything about Aliens, not only the making of, but the impact and the influence, uh, stories you've never heard before from people who worked on it, uh, the stars and the people behind the scenes. Uh, Ian Nathan is directing that. I'm executive producing it. Uh, Aliens Expanded is definitely one to check out. You go to aliensexpanded.com. Mm -hmm. um, uh, wait, I'm going to get that URL wrong. Go to creatorvc.com and you'll be able to find it because it's <laughs> me for some reason all of a sudden. But all the socials are at uh, Aliens Expanded. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, we have, we're we looking in terms of In Search of Darkness, we want to continue the franchise. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to do 90s next. I, I think three really movies cool. about the 80s is, is pretty pretty good. 14 hours of 80s goodness is pretty good. And I think yes. uh, a lot of people are, are clamoring for 80, for 90s horror. Um, and we're also thinking about 70s horror as well. And we're also, in, you know, slowly percolating a, 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 a movie about fantasy, In Search of Legends. Yes. Um, there's a variety of things we've got going. In Search of Tomorrow did really well. It was very well received. Uh, In Search of Tomorrow 2 is something that we're, we're – we're in the development stage of right now. Um, we have lots of things going. FPS, first person shooter, that's gonna be coming yeah, out. Yeah. That's That's been in, produced. And uh, um, the way these things work is uh, just Creator VC is this wonderful company. Uh, Robin Block is the CEO. He's executive producer of all these projects. Um, it's by the fans for the fans. And so anything and everything we do, it's not in a vacuum. We, we incorporate everyone who's passionate about these topics, these genres, these projects. We bring them in uh, to be part of the, the process, the filmmaking process, right. until the final sale. Uh, and so Aliens Expanded is we're going to have a whole year of activities. So uh, even though, you know, the crowdfunding is done, it's not too late to get part, be part of that. You know, and just to follow what we do, if you are interested in in being part of all this stuff, you know, talking to us, the transparency of the filmmakers, talking about mm -hmm. what we love, what we think, what, what you would want to have as part of the project that we're doing, that's something that we really enjoy doing because ultimately, at the end of the day, we're fans. We love this stuff. We make the projects and the movies that we love, but we want to be able to incorporate what people want, uh, and yes. that's incredibly important to us. And if you're not engaging with the community, 
whether it's daily on our discords or whether it's you know backer events where we have q and a's and things like that um i think it's incredibly important to be in touch and uh, a, a big giant fan community about all yes. this stuff. And, and that makes me happy that i get to be part of it me too uh, for the fans by the fans and i'm glad to like I said, I'm glad to be some part of the way part of this in some small form as I am. And it's been really great talking to you. Uh, I'm, I'm super, so much more excited for this than I have been in, in you know, <laughs> since I backed, we, since we I backed it. Like the blaze. Yeah. The yeah. Well, I mean, I backed it so long ago and now it's, now it's getting closer. I can feel it and I'm getting really, really excited and I cannot wait to see what you guys put together. I, I love hearing what you guys got planned. The 90 stuff sounds really cool to me because, um, I always felt like '90s horror was like where it slowly started to fade out, and I, you know, cause like the first like maybe five years of the '90s had some really good stuff. Then it kind of just like horror faded away. So I'm like, really interested to see what you guys would have to say with that and everybody you guys talk to. But I yeah, really it's, appreciate it's, a, it's a it's a different dynamic. It's a very different dynamic. It's it's, it's going to be approached in a very different way because of the output and and what types of films were made and. You know, uh, everything from influential films where everything turned into in the wake of Silence of the Lambs. Everyone was a, yes. everything was pretty much a serial killer movie or seven. And, you know, a lot yeah. of great films and not so great films mm -hmm. about serial killers, but it's almost a serial killer decade. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, CGI also was an unfriendly counterpart to practical effects because yes. the nascent technology of CGI and people realizing that wait, we can't do it exactly like uh, Jurassic Park, but they made it look so good, easy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's lots to chew on. It's true. And I'm looking forward to that. And I thank you once again for your time. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for, uh, you know, these documentaries. Truly, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And uh, I pre really appreciate you, your enthusiasm and the stuff that you do uh, on on your on your uh, on fanzine, if I don't know what to call it these days. Because I, I think <laughs> pod, podcast and YouTube and it's a it's a little bit of mixture of everything podcast videos whatever. <laughs> yeah, know? but uh, Greg, I appreciate it and I appreciate your enthusiasm and and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, and to everybody watching, please go check out uh, 80shorrordoc.com. Click, click that link, create a VC, follow them on their socials down there. Yes, it's all in the description and everything. Um, and get get back in this and share this video out, like, comment, uh, you know, subscribe, do all that good stuff. And I thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you guys on the next one. Bye.